For Lincoln Alexander, it's been a life of firsts. Canada's first black member of parliament, Ontario's first black lieutenant governor. And recently, at the age of 81, Lincoln Alexander has been called upon to play a leadership role in the community on the controversial issue of racial profiling by the police. Lincoln Alexander, I mean, you've seen it all and you've done it all. Give us some sense of how different Ontario is today for black people compared to when you were growing up in your youth. How much has it changed? <laughs> well, there's been a considerable amount of change. Uh, first, we can start with me. Did you ever think you'd have a black lieutenant governor? Uh, did you ever think you'd have uh, billionaires? Did you ever think that you'd have lawyers, doctors, um, people in business who were making a significant contribution? Oh, there's been a significant change. I remember as a young fellow, my father was a porter, mm -hmm. and that's all you could get. My mother was That was kind of almost the best job you that could get. That was the best job. And it wasn't a bad job, mm -hmm. Alan, in terms of bringing home money, but it was the demeaning part of the job. Uh, of course, then my mother was a, a maid. Um, so that's what it was when I was growing up. And of course, I come from a, uh, a separated family. My mother didn't like what my father was doing. He was a railroad porter. <clears throat> and porters, of course, used to travel the width and breadth of this country. So that meant that they had, uh, just like sailors, uh, they had left femme in every port. And my mother just got sick of that nonsense. And she said uh, one day to herself, I'm leaving. So that was back in 1936-37. I was going to Riverdale Collegiate then. So it was, there was a dramatic change in my life because my mother went to New York. She called me over in 36, 37. I stayed there until the war uh, broke out. And then she said, Linny, you have to go back home. I said, why, mommy? She said, well, the war is on and you have to go and join something or be conscripted. So then I came back to Canada. And, uh, but I had the experience of living in New York, which, which, was a great, uh, which was a great learning process because at that time, uh, there I saw black people uh, in Canada, where I was in Ontario. You, you'd see the odd one, right? You which know, is uh, well, another big, huge difference. Because that, back it, back when, when you were growing up, there were hardly any black people. There were hardly any. But I went to New York, saw the countless thousand black people from all—well, not from all over the world, but from various parts of the world, primarily from the West Indies and primarily from uh, Jamaica. So there was a distinct difference, and of course, I learned a lot as a young fella. Life was raw. I remember the first job I ever had. Um, my mother was working the laundry. She said, I'll get you in the laundry. And I said, okay, mommy. So I was going to River, not Riverdale, but uh, I was going to a school in New York City. And at the time, so I took the job in the laundry down in the lower Manhattan. So I lasted a week. And at the end of the week, the guy said, well, we can't use you anymore. Sorry. So that broke my heart because I was working like the devil, as I still am. So I asked my mother, I said, what, what happened? So she wouldn't tell me first. Then in the long, she said, well, he wanted to go to bed with me. And I told him no. And it was at that time I learned so much about life and how it can disrupt your life by man's treatment to mankind, as the case may be. And I've never forgotten that. And, uh, and I love my mother. Uh, I still think of her. When, when she told me that she said, no, you can't. So Were you that, aware of racism when you were growing up? I mean, was it not, prevalent? Not, well, if you're in Harlem, <laughs> you don't feel racism as in terms of white against black because there are very, very few <laughs> white right. people there. But here in Ontario. And back here in Ontario. It wasn't that, you see, the numbers didn't uh, allow for racism because they weren't, they <laughs> weren't afraid of you. You weren't a threat. And so they could overlook you. But in doing so, uh, you knew that you were treated as a second-class citizen. There are certain places that you couldn't go in at Toronto. There are certain uh, jobs you couldn't have or they wouldn't give you. Uh, there was a lot of disrespect. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it wasn't that violent kind. But you knew, as you'd put it, your place in society. Mm. Uh, but so it's changed considerably. Uh, because as I said now, um, you do have racism, there is no doubt about that. Uh, if you don't believe there's racism here, then you're either sleeping or you're dead or you're, or you're drinking too much alcohol because, you know, it is here. I, I want to talk about that, but, but first mm -hmm. I, want to, but, I want to continue the, yeah. the, the Lincoln Alexander story. That, yeah. uh, you well, served in the Second World War, yeah, I was, you did an undergraduate uh, right. at, at, McMaster. at McMaster, then you went to, then you went to Oz, law school. Uh, law school. Even there, though, you couldn't escape 
a no. certain sense of being different. And you tell a story of a rather bigoted about. professor. I know what you're talking about. Well, he's bigoted. I didn't know what he was. Anyway, I'm in my last year. I'm married. I got married in 1948. I'm sitting in the back with Pat Hart, who became one of our top-notch justices. And at the end of the lecture, uh, the, uh, the dean said, uh, well, just like looking for a nigger in the woodpile. Now, I've been sitting in this guy's class for four years, never asked a question. I'm not as flamboyant and full of charisma as I am now, you know, and I was very quiet. But something struck me. I said, how can that guy say? I said, I put my hand up. Sir? Oh, yes, Mr. Alexander. I said, I can understand the language. I think it was tort. I know what you're talking about, but I don't understand this thing about uh, looking for a nigger in the woodpile. Well, all hell broke loose. Everybody says it. I said, sir, everybody may say it, but you shouldn't say it. I said, you're the dean of, law, of the law school. You're in a class of 200 people. I think there are only two blacks in the class, Ken Roof, who, who was a lawyer, and, and myself. I said, you should not say that, and I, I resent it. And I hope you don't say it again. Well, they said, well, everybody says it. Well, all hell broke loose. Anyway, I, I, I checked them. I've, that's when I became a man, I tell you, because I'm in my last year of law school, and I'm telling this guy to go to hell. So I picked the phone, and I told my then beautiful wife, I said, dear, I just blew it. She said, what do you do now? I said, I told the dean to go to hell in a few short words. She said, you did. She says, okay, well, I'm behind you. So now I'm sweating for the, for the rest of the year, really believing in my heart that I've just messed it up. I'm not going to pass. Sure enough, we used to determine whether you passed or not by looking at the Globe and Mail. Uh -huh. And the, the night, in the morning, the, the Globe and Mail came out, there's Alexander's name in there. Up in the top corner of the class, I'll have you know, Mr. Gregg. So now we're having the big party. After we all graduate, you have the party. Here's the dean. Dean Smalley Baker. I'll mention the name. He's dead, so it doesn't matter. I shook his hand. I said, you know, dean, I'm surprised I'm here. He said, why? I said, well, you know, I checked in the class there. I told you you were wrong. But how dare you? I'm a man. I said, well, you're a man or not. You said the wrong thing. So we started the whole argument all over again. <laughs> but I've been proud of that standing up and being counted. Now, and from that day on, I stand up and I'm counted. John Diefenbaker seeks you out. He recruits you to yes. run as a member, a member of member parliament. Of parliament. Right. First time in 1965. You right. don't quite make it. But in 1968, in the face of Trudeau mania, I won. Here you get elected in Hamilton uh, West, first black member of parliament ever. I mean, how big a breakthrough was that? Well, that was big. Didn't it? You know, not with any of the smaller parties, but with one of the mainline parties. It was so big that the United States press wanted to know, well, how many black people are in your riding? And uh, I said maybe four or five hundred, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, out of a hundred thousand. So they were kind of shocked. That was a tremendous, to me, and I think to a lot of people, uh, it was a an impact that uh, gave us all a lesson that a black person could become a member of parliament. But at the same time, Al, I must say that um, as a result of that position, I had to work hard because I couldn't afford to fail. In other words, I couldn't do less. Even now, I do my best to be the best. I work very hard because I don't want anybody saying that Link Alexander can't handle the job. You, you said or, that before, that being a role model has some it, real it, responsibilities. It ain't easy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because every eye is on you, and you have to behave accordingly, because whatever you do that's shameful can affect, I think, your people, whoever the hell my people are. So being, a, as you say, a role model, it, it, it calls for a certain amount of discipline. It calls for a certain amount of knowledge. It calls for a certain amount of sacrifice. And uh, it's hard. It's, um, it's not hard, but it's, uh, it's a role that's ever present. Mm -hmm. You have to maintain excellence. You have to pursue excellence at all times. So I'm glad about Diefenbaker. As a matter of fact, it's a funny thing. Yes, he asked me to run, and I did run, and I won on, on the second shot. And I ended up being a seatmate in the House of Commons. Now, that's something I'll never forget, because I find it strange here. He asked me to run former prime minister and all that sort of thing, and then I ended up sitting beside him. My role was to go up a, a, to his office, bring him down to question period, and then he'd get down to question period. I said, Chief, Jimmy Jerome was on the speaker, Jerome. Chief, have you got any questions? Nobody wants to hear from me. I don't know. About five minutes before the question period, Alan's over, I feel a question coming on. I said, Chief, 
for God's sake, all these backbenchers sitting around trying to get a question in, and now you went, well, if you don't want to do it, I don't know why you're sitting beside me. I said, well, Chief, take so I go up to Jimmy Drummond. I said, Jimmy, the chief wants to ask a question. He says, why now? I said, don't ask me. I'm just the messenger. He was a lot of fun, but tough. <laughs> he didn't like, he, well, I, now, I won't go too far with he didn't like. But, <laughs> but uh, on that, I mean, you, uh, you, you won four elections, uh, served in Parliament from uh, 68 right up to uh, Joe Clark's uh, right. uh, government, your Minister of, uh, of Labor. Labor. How did your colleagues relate to you? How did they treat oh, we, you? Oh, no problem. I must definitely say I never had any reaction. We'd tell jokes, but they weren't malicious or vicious. And what, you know, because the House of Commons, it's full of people from all over the world, from mm -hmm. various cultures and whatnot. But there was no singling me out as being the black. No, I had to check the press. That's, now I can remember, the media, with all their glory and baloney. Every time I asked a question, the black member from Hamilton West said. There was always that adjective. Yeah, I say, so one day, I, I got sick of the adjective. You know, because we had Italian, Ukrainian, Polish, Jewish, down there, but it's me. The, the, the member of uh, Hamburg with the black man. I said one day somewhere, I said, listen, I'm getting sick of this nonsense. I said, you guys treat me like a man. You treat me as one of the others, and I don't like this, the black member from Hamilton. You don't do it to the others, so don't do it to me. It stopped. That's one thing. The other thing that happened was when Stanfield made me the critic uh, of uh, immigration. immigration sure. A guy from Vancouver wrote a letter that hit every editorial page, an editorial, very poor choice that Mr. Stanfield uh, pursued by naming me as the immigration critic because he's going to let any black, every black person in the world into Canada. And at this time, and who will then burn up universities? That's the time when they were playing right. on uh, Sir George Williams. Remember that? Sir sure. George Williams. Yeah. Stanfield called me up. I said, he says, Link, I said, sir, have you seen that editorial? No, I asked him, have you seen the editorial? I see, and he says, it's, it's a lot of nonsense. Don't worry about it. So in terms of anything down the house, I, well, I was a leader down there. And I'm, you know, I'm arrogant enough to say that, yeah, I was a leader. They followed Link, and I followed a lot. But where Link went, a lot of guys went. You know, sure. so, uh, now, but on uh, that, I mean, while, again, the pace may be too slow for many, there has seemed to be some real improvement in the representation of, of East Indian, Asian members of Parliament. We're seeing more and more and more. But since right. your time, we haven't seen that many more black members of Parliament are elected. They've tried. Well, I can't. Well, I, I know they're members of Parliament. We did have the chap from uh, Windsor, NDP. Uh, I just looked at the other day. We, I don't think you have that many, maybe two or three. Uh, it, it's not an easy thing trying to be a member. I was very lucky. I, I, in order to become a member of Parliament, you, 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 you have to have a constituency that knows you. The vast majority of them will support you. The money will flow in. You just can't depend on, on black people to... Oh, of course. Uh, you see, so you have to get in there. You have to be in the community to a great extent so your name is well known. People can understand you. People can trust you. People want you as a leader, so, but they're trying, and I'm very uh, pleased when I see so many running, but I dislike those who say, well, the reason I lost is because I'm black. Well, you know, you, you can tell them, I, I can tell them that the reason they lost is they weren't particularly well organized. They didn't represent the whole community. In other words, you have blacks on the committee only, you just can't have black. You have to have blacks, English, Irish, Scotch, Jewish, and you have these little separate identities who are pulling together can elect, but if you go to one, you're out. So there's a lot to becoming a member, of, a, a member of Parliament, and most of it isn't up to you. You have to go to the people. The people, the vast majority of people, have to understand you. They have to know you, and uh, if they know you and if they like you, they'll come to your side. But you just can't go to one segment, and this is where they make a mistake. Now, among many other responsibilities that you continue to hold. You're the chairman of the Canadian Race Relations uh -huh. uh, Foundation, and you played a, a real leadership role for a long time in terms of relations between the police uh, and, the, and the black community, especially uh, yeah. here in well, Toronto. Well, not a long time, not with, not with respect to black, but this, this was as a result of that Star article, Alan. Uh, so On I'm racial the, profiling. Yes. I'm the, as you said, I'm the chairman of the Canadian Race uh, Relations uh, Foundation, appointed by a liberal. Jean Cretchen, he says, I want that guy. So I'm that guy. So I'm sitting there minding my business. Uh, 
I pick up this Toronto Star in three inch headlines, which I didn't like the three inch headline business because, you know, three inch headlines are supposed to be for war and matters of such international upheaval that it's warrants. It says that cops stop blacks, etc., so forth, and they get the. And they, I said, now what do I say? Uh, do I just sit here and uh, pretend I don't see it? On the one hand, I'm chair of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. I'm supposed to be in the forefront of the fight against racism. And on the other hand, I'm the Honorary Chief of Police of Toronto. Mm -hmm. I'm the Chief's counselor and advisor and help when I can. I said, Link, you got to get in the war again. So I picked up the phone, called Chief Fanti, great guy. He's doing a hell of a great job, I can say that, and I mean it. And those and polls all say that he is doing a great job, and that includes blacks as well, who indicate that he's doing a great job. But at this particular time, I said, Chief, I got to say something. I said, I'm going to call it the Toronto Star. And I don't know what I'm going to say, but I can't sit tight with that phrase and with that policy or whatever, or that, that wrong. Because you, you claim racial profiling has been going on for oh, forever. Oh, it's been going on forever, for God's sake. Uh, so I said, I'm going to say something. So I thought of the word summit. I can't even spell summit, but it sounded great. The prime minister holds summits. The uh, president of the United States holds summits. I'm going to hold a summit. But people misunderstood what the hell I'm talking about. My summit included all the heavy hitters, the movers and shakers within the justice system, like, uh, like uh, the mayor, Norm Gardner, uh, the OPP, uh, the Police Association, Ministers of the Crown, because they have the money and they can move amendments. Uh, people such as that, that's my summit. Everybody wanted to join the party. I said, no, you can't join. Well, you can't do this all by yourself. I said, who says I can't? You know, these are, these are the umbrella groups uh, who are black. I can't do it. I said, I'm doing it, and if you're not good, I, you won't be on it because I don't really want you. You're going to say the same thing. Oh, there's racism and racism. I want the people who can fix it. And that's what the summit's all about. And we're coming to the end of the first session. Uh, very soon, this, in the month of February, they're coming back and they know what they're supposed to do. I left them with certain, no, not I, but we left them with certain points of interest and concern that were presented to the chief by way of the city of Toronto, a council, their council moved a motion that indicated about 10 or 11, 12 different things. One was racial profiling, and the other one's an independent uh, complaint uh, uh, body. Mm -hmm. Those were two of the main ones, but there are a whole lot of other things. So I left them with all this stuff, the OPP, the RCMP, the, the all police within this problem. So they're coming back, and I want answers because we've been procrastinated, we've been pussyfooting around this thing for a long time, and there is a problem. You're one of the few prominent members of the black community who said, look, we may have a problem with racism in the police force in certain segments, but that in certain segments of the black community, we've also got a problem with violence. There's no question and, and we're seeing, you know, all of this, these, these terrible reports of black on black, black violence on black. And, and shooting. What's, what's behind that, and, and what do you think the black community... You know what's behind it? It's, it's the, it's the, you know what's happening? A lot of the violence you see, as I've been told, comes as a result of the drug business. It comes as a result of the social setup that young blacks, there are no jobs, they were discriminated against, or on the other hand, they're not trained to have jobs. The lack of parental discipline, single parent, primarily mothers. And so they're out there hopeless, easy targets, but the unfortunate thing is they take the targets on their own. They make their own targets. In other words, you don't hear too much about blacks shooting white people. No. It's blacks shooting blacks. And the thing that bothers me, there's a conspiracy of silence. Blacks see this. Within the white black community. That's right. Yes. But they're reluctant to go to the police for what perhaps it's through fear of, of the gang. I think it's primarily through fear. But that's not helping the situation whatsoever. This violence against their own is a terrible thing, and I don't know the answer. But I know that we're all concerned about it. I know that we're looking at it. Fantino is looking at it. All social structures are looking at it. What's the, the result is the poverty that exists. All these young kids just hanging around the streets, nothing to do. Um, well, that can backfire. So this is not a black problem. I, I hope that 
everybody else in the city understands that if you think it's just a black problem, it's not. It's our problem. It's a collective mm -hmm. problem. And they all should be screaming at the top of their voice, do something about it. Just not the blacks, but do something about it. The Chief of Police Fantino went down to uh, Jamaica, Jamaica to see what some people say is, uh, or to look into what some people say is the roots of a lot of the criminal problem right. in the black right. community in Canada. What's your opinion on that? Well, I don't know. Well, my mother is a Jamaican. I'm a very proud Jamaican. I, I, I love Jamaicans. You, you have a lot of Jamaicans here. It's just unfortunate that you have a few who spoil the image. Like, it'll take 10 people, put their papers, put their faces on the paper every day, and you think that's the collective will and thoughts of the black person in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Very few. Most Jamaicans are hardworking, paying their taxes. They don't like what they see. They don't want what they see, but there's a lot of poverty in certain parts of Jamaica, you know. You're not up in the North Shore, up in Montego Bay and the Ocho Rios and San Antonio. It's all in the city of Kingston. Mm -hmm. Big cities breed big problems. Unlike, just like Toronto, it has its problems as well. So I guess we try to find out what happens down there uh, that these kids grow up and then they come over here and they have the same sort of hopelessness. Notice how I said hopelessness. And then it's easy pickers. Everybody seems to come to Canada and think, well, this is a place to do crime. As a matter of fact, they say, all the terrorists live here, there's a lot of terrorists here. And I think he wants to have a, a, a firm background so that he can go to the community and tell them, this is what I found. And this is one way that we can approach this, this uh, particular problem. You have been involved in this issue for a long time. I mean, what, is there any single thing you can think of that would really help relations between the black community and, uh, and the police? Because the problem seems to be kind of vicious. It, it preys on itself and grows over time. Yeah, well, Alan, it's not as easy as it looks. I, I think that all black people, or no, people in general, they're looking for respect, they're looking for justice, and they're looking for equality. And this is why I say it's not a black problem. This is a, a people problem. Everybody should want his brother or his sister, regardless of race, sex, or creed, to be treated equally with respect and with justice. Now, how that, to me, it's got to be a groundswell from the populace who say, yes, that's right, and you politicians, that's what we want. We want you to move legislation. Police, we want you to understand. Uh, people, we want you to understand. We all should be first class citizens and there should be no second class citizen. But it's got to have a public, it's got to have a, a, a real groundswell of concern. In other words, almost to the extent where you're marching on the street, because if, there, if there's no real groundswell of concern, the politician can sit back and say, oh, what the hell, it's a, it'll go away. This sort of stuff will never go away. I want to ask you about that. Because there's some black activists who say that you know if these problems in the black community are going to be solved, what we ha what you has to be seen is that it's the black leadership in the community who's got to stand up and say this black on black violence is is wrong, and we want these criminals rooted, uprooted, and, and turfed out. They of say our, that of now. Our, of black our people say that now. We why, do, why does the white community not hear that as much as we as we should? Because they're uh, they feel it's. It's safer to go in your little living room and drink your beer and look at TV and don't get involved. Um, I don't know why, but thank goodness you do have some. I listened to Alan Borovoy here the other day condemning a university because they prevented, which, which was well, because they condemned somebody for wanting to speak, uh, was from Israel. Right. And I listened to him. He said, you have no right to condemn somebody Notwithstanding what they're saying, they have the right to say it in this country, freedom of speech, particularly when you have a lot of people there who are non-aligned, but they want to hear it. It's the university's right to see to it that you get an education no matter what it's like. So there are some people who are standing up and counted, but they can't go to sleep. As I tell your audience now, this is not a black problem. This is a problem that affects all of us. And if it affects all of us, then we all should stand up because things like this, if you can recall the history of the United States, it can erupt. I'm not preaching violence. I'm not saying it'll happen. But if you have a satisfied, a dissatisfied portion of your people unhappy, you've got a problem. 
and they should be worried about that problem because that problem can spill over into violence. And we've seen it happen here in Toronto. When, when was it? When, when they rioted down in, uh, in the middle of Young Street? Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. guess people have forgotten that. Yeah. And then they all ran for cover because they didn't know what the hell to do about it. That's what happens when people aren't happy, when they're not satisfied, and they're treated like second-class citizens, and there's no hope, and there's no understanding, there's no love, and there's no brotherhood existing. And well, it can happen. Looking back, what's the single accomplishment that you're proudest of? See, that's always a tough question for me. I, I, I can name a number of things. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm proud that I listened to my mother when she said go to school because I went to school and I became the lieutenant governor. I'm proud of the fact that I met the queen personally. I'm proud of the fact that I was uh, appointed to lieutenant governor of the biggest province in Ontario. That means that you sit next to the queen. If she comes here, you're bigger than Quebec or BC, Manitoba, etc. So you are number two. I'm, proud, I'm just proud of my life. I'm proud of my, my wife who counseled me after some 50 years. I'm a, I'm a lonely, older person. Notice I didn't say old. I said older person now, trying to eke a living, uh, trying to live on my few pensions, which are very small, and uh, trying to live the good life. But Alan, I can't answer that question. But there's, I've been so blessed with so many opportunities, and I just hope I've discharged them. Uh, with meaning and with uh, positive uh, results. Uh, there's, always somebody, there's always somebody offering me a job. Right now I'm supposed to be, uh, I'm giving up one job to get another job, being the honorary ambassador for the Commonwealth Games. See, people look at me, they say, he's got to be smart because he's 81, he's had all these jobs. But if you think about it, I don't hold jobs very, very often. I, I mean, uh, for any length of time. <laughs> but they you're, think I'm smart. <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're not slowing down at all. Uh, and so what's, no, I, what's next for Link Alexander? Whatever they come up with. Link and Alexander, it's always a great pleasure to it's have you. It's a pleasure being with you. Thanks you bring so back some very fond memories, I'll tell you, Alan. Thank you for inviting me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.